I'm glad I get to do this chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, loving this chapter. Uh, I'm going to go through the first 18 verses, but you'll notice I'm gonna skip I'm gonna read it, but I'm not gonna talk about them, verses three through five, because I'm gonna end with those verses, okay? And so if you have your Bibles, open them up, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. If not, you can follow along on the screen. Let's, let me just kind of do a quick verse by verse, and then we'll get to the main thing that I want us to talk about tonight. Verse one, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Now I, Paul, myself, urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold towards you when absent. Now, there's a tone of sarcasm in Paul's voice. Paul was being accused of being two-faced, of being one way when he was with them and another way uh, when he was absent. They were saying, boy, you are tough in your letters. Man, you're, you're Mr. Tough Guy when you write these letters are hard on us. But when you come here, you're, you're meek and, and you're mild. And I'll talk more about that in a second. But Paul was anything but weak. He was anything but not courageous. In fact, if Paul, before he got saved, was putting people into prison. So he had that thing where he would risk his life and he, and he was a tough guy. Uh, so he wasn't, he wasn't a wimp but he was meek. Now, there's another man when he walked on this earth that was very meek, and that was Jesus Christ. Meekness is not a weakness. The word meekness actually means strength under control. Picture in your mind a horse full of strength, strong, powerful. If, if a Rider was on top of a horse, and that horse just wanted to do what he wanted. He could just take that rider, and he could go wherever he wanted. But a properly trained horse is meek. In other words, all it takes to a, to a, to a meek horse, one that has strength under control, is just a gentle push on the reins this way, and it goes left. A push on the reins this way, and it goes right. Just a slow pull back, and it stops. It's still powerful, but yet it can be controlled just by this. That's the picture of meekness. Now, Jesus himself was very meek. In fact, in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, we read about uh, him. He's describing himself here uh, in a way that I think probably describes the Apostle Paul. Uh, these guys are taking some time, so I kind of threw them off with the order there. There it is. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest or your souls. He's gentle and, and humble in heart. Other translation says that he's meek in heart. So Jesus was often accused, believe it or not, of being kind of soft. He was soft towards a woman caught in the act of adultery, wasn't he? Everybody else said, stoner, stoner. And, and, and he, he just gave her uh, grace. And so he was, in fact, they also said concerning his teaching, he said, we've never heard such gracious words coming from a, a rabbi. Just words full of grace and, and full of love and full of peace. But don't mistake Jesus for being weak. Oh, he was meek, but man, there was power that was being held back. We, we see that power creep out at his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. Look at John 18, verses four through six. As they get the verses up there, you're gonna see something that is really, it gets oftentimes overlooked in the Bible. It's the only the second instance that I see where his power kind of just kind of just creeps out. It's not so much intentional. The other the first instance is when the woman with the issue of blood grabbed hold of the hem of his garment and Jesus turned around and said, Hey, who touched me? Oh, Apostle, well, everybody's touching you. We're in a crowd. He goes, No, somebody touched me. I felt power come out of me. And so he 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 felt that, that power. Here we see in verse four of John 18, so Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, whom, whom do you seek? This is when they came to arrest him with Judas leading the crowd. Verse five, they answered him, Jesus and Nazarene. And he said to them, I am he. Remember one of the, one of the names and descriptions of God is I am. What is your name? 
I am is my name. And Judas also, who is betraying him, was standing with them. And look what happens in verse six. So when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. The, the power of what he said caused there to be some sort of force that kind of pushed them back and knocked them over. So Jesus was not weak by any stretch of imagination, but he was meek. He, he didn't let that power out. It was under control. May we learn to be meek. I want strong men in this church, and I want strong women in this church, but I also want meek men and women. I, I want that strength to be under control. I don't want it to be out of control where you just fly off the handle and, and you're abrasive and everybody's afraid of you because you've got such a short fuse. Stand up and be angry when it's appropriate to be angry. But other than that, just be meek. Now we go on, verse two. Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I ask that when I am present, I need not be bold with the confidence with which I propose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, they're not of the flesh, but are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. And we're destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of of Christ, verse six. We are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. He says, you are looking at things as they are outwardly. If anyone is confident in himself that he is Christ, let him consider this again within himself that just as he is Christ, so also are we. Stop right there, guys, for a second. Paul is being accused of being two-faced, of being bold in his letters, but being a coward when he comes there because he doesn't address them the way that he did in his letters. He's being told that, hey, he's not really called. He's not really an apostle. He's being told that, man, he's, he's not real uh, seemingly pretty and stuff. In fact, it's very interesting. From a Christian writing in about 200 AD, it was discovered, somebody described the apostle Paul, what his physical appearance looked like. I thought this was fascinating. They said the Apostle Paul was a man of small stature with a bald head, crooked legs, in a good state of body. In other words, he, you know, his body seemed somewhat healthy other than the, the legs and stuff. Eyebrows meeting, just, you know, unibrow, and a nose somewhat hooked. Now, I'm no model scout male model scout, but I don't think that's what I'd be looking for. I'm looking for a model for, for a magazine or something. That doesn't sound real impressive. Small, short, bald, big nose, unibrow. And so people said, again, he goes, you're looking at things from the flesh. You're looking at things from the outside. And remember what God told Samuel when he was to anoint the new king. What did he say after Samuel anointed all of David's brothers and couple of the good look ones first and, and, and uh, Samuel said, Lord, there's no more. And, and it's this little guy, you sure? And, and God said, yeah, man looks at the outward. God looks at a man's heart. God looks inside. He, he doesn't care. And that's, that's a word for you young people. Hey, let me talk to our young people just for a second. There's such pressure to fit in at school, to fit in among your peers and stuff. Social media has really heightened that on fitting in how many friends you have and are you liked, are you accepted and stuff. Let me just say that. That's not how we should judge ourselves. First of all, you don't wanna be like most of those kids anyway. Second of all, God has made you unique. You're, you're fearfully and wonderfully made, the Bible says. Don't try to fit in with other people. Don't compromise your values just to fit in. Trust me with this. You live your life sold out for the Lord. 
You make stands, you love people, you don't do the things that you know God wanted you to do, and I guarantee you, you'll have more friends than you can shake a stick at. Because people will respect you. They, they, they will look at you and say, there's something different about you. Oh, you're not gonna have a ton of friends because a lot of the worldly friends don't want anything to do with you. But you're gonna have a few really good friends, and those are the friends you want, you're really good friends. So don't worry about trying to fit in to be popular. You live your life for Christ and you will be popular. Trust me, I did it in baseball. I was the oddball when I was playing professional baseball. I, I, was, I was the guy that, that was living completely different than pretty much the other 24 guys on my baseball team. And yet, you know what? I, I was respected. I had people to tell me later, we respect you and we look up to you. And I, God gave me a few friends and stuff. But, I, but young people, it's better to be looked up to and respected than to have a bunch of friends and lose respect for yourself, okay? So that's my word to you, you young people, okay? It's a tough time to live in, but you can do it, okay? All right, let's continue on. For even if I boast somewhat further about our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, he says, hey, I've got authority, and, but I'm, I'm not gonna come here and just, just you know, beat you down with it. The authority I have is to build you up. That, that's why God gave me this thing. I don't have to prove my authority by coming here and saying, you're lousy and you're rotten and you're not. I, no, that's not what I, I have authority for. I will not be put to shame, he says. For I do not wish to seem as if I would terrify you by my letters. For they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is unimpressive and his speech contemptible. Let such a person consider this, that what we are in word by letters when absent, such persons we are also indeed when present. In other words, saying, hey, we're, I'm not two-faced. I'm the, I'm the same way in person. I'm the same way when I write letters, okay? Let such a person, uh, for we're not bold to class or compare ourselves with some of those who commend themselves. But when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are without understanding, but we will not boast beyond our measure, but within the measure of the sphere which God apportioned to us as a measure to reach even as far as you. Stop right there just for a second. Paul says, hey, I'm not going to be like what these guys are doing. In fact, let's go to the next verse, guys. I think it's key for what I'm gonna say. I think the next verse needs to come up. Yeah, for we are not overextending ourselves as if we did not reach to you, for we were the first to come even as far as as you in the gospel of Christ. What Paul is saying, he's saying, guys, these other guys that are demeaning me, that are confusing you, that are, are trying to slight me so they can slide in and have a place in the church, he says, that's not their territory. That, that's my territory. God called me to start this church. I founded this church. Hey, there, there's plenty of room. Go, go somewhere else. Go to the unknown regions. That's what I did. Paul says, I went into areas where there wasn't a church, where Christ wasn't preached, and I started a church there. Why do you guys want to come build on my thing? Go start your own thing. You're, you're crossing over out of your lane. That's what he's saying. Stay in your lane. Go, go, go out there to the people who don't know Christ. Don't try to jump onto somebody else's territory. Verse 15, not boasting beyond our measure, that is, in other men's labors, but with the hope that as your faith grows, we will be within our spirit enlarged even more by you. In other words, Paul is saying, hey, I'm not, I'm not trying to come and, and steal people from other people's churches. I'm not trying to do that. I'm gonna pour into you. This is the, the, this is the area that God gave me. God called me to preach and start a church here. But as I help you grow, you will now go out and, and now my influence will spread through you. So, so that's how I'm gonna grow church. I'm gonna go step in some other guy's church or, or try to take some other guy's congregation. I wanna get you built up. You will go out and in essence, my influence will spread. Verse 16, so as to preach the gospel even to the regions beyond you, there he is, and not to boast on what has been accomplished in the sphere of another. But he who boasts is to boast in the Lord. Now, here Paul quotes a passage of scripture that they most likely knew very well. It's Jeremiah chapter nine. And it's kind of a, a little rebuke of them. 
Let me read to you Jeremiah 9, verses 23, 24 to get the full effect of what Paul was trying to convey to these critics of his. Jeremiah 9, 23 says, Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast of his might, let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for I delight in these things, declares the Lord. So Paul's saying, hey, you guys are boasting in your title, that, you, that you're, you're an apostle or, or, or you're a church leader and you're boasting in that and you're, you're boasting that, hey, when I came to this church, man, all of a sudden we begin to grow and, and, and I'm one of the foundational pillars of this church and, man, I'm, I'm, I'm comparing myself with Paul, man. He's kind of, you know, ugly and, and I'm better looking than him and, and he doesn't speak really as well as, as, as so-and-so over here. And he's saying all these things, he's boasting these things and Paul says, hey, if you're gonna boast, Boast in the things that God really values. How you doing with your wisdom? How you doing with your loving kindness? How you doing with your mercy and stuff? If you're gonna boast, boast in those things. Don't boast in these outward things. These guys were fleshy. They were, they were just fleshy. And then last, verse 18. For it is not he who commends himself that is approved, but he whom the Lord commends. Don't live your life for the approval of man. Live your life for the approval of God. If you can look at yourself in the mirror and if you can look God in the eye and, and, and be okay with looking God in the eye and be okay with yourself saying, hey, I don't, I don't have to turn for myself. I don't have to be ashamed of myself and my behavior. If you can do that, then you're right on. You're right on if you can do that. that that'll, that'll serve you well, okay? Don't worry about what other people think about you. You're, you're serving and living for an audience of one. That's him. Now, now, let's get to what I wanna teach about tonight, okay? Let's get back to verses three through four. Okay, <clears throat> man, crime is going crazy, isn't it? Unbelievable. Things that we never thought we'd see, we're seeing. People just helping themselves to stuff in the store and walking out and not paying for anything and our own government just just bring just breaking the law, just flat out breaking the law, not enforcing the law, and just it's just wild and crazy. And because of that, people are investing thousands of dollars in security. Home security uh, business, my goodness, they're 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 making a killing. People are buying cameras and lighting and fencing and alarm systems and self-defense weapons and deadbolt locks on doors and windows, all in hopes of making their home basically a fortress or a safe place where they can go and I know I can lay my head down at night and not worry. Uh, why? Because the people that we love and value are worth the money and the effort to protect, right? So we're saying there's, there's no dollar amount, I'll do whatever it takes to protect my family. My loved ones. And as important it is to, yeah, protect our loved ones, protect our home, here's the crazy thing. Many Christians leave their minds and thoughts totally unprotected. We spend all this time and all this effort protecting our homes, and yet our minds, our brains, we, we just basically just open the door and say, just come on in. Anybody and anything that wants to come on in, just come on in. And that's the picture that Paul is wanting to Show us there in 2 Corinthians 10, uh, 3 through 5. Let me just read it again just for sake of reminder to you. Verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. He's saying we're in a war, but we don't fight it the way that a military fights it with guns and tanks and everything. We, we, we fight differently. For the weapons of our warfare, they're not of the flesh, but they are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We're destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Ephesians 6 says that our struggle's not against flesh and blood, a very familiar passage, but against the principalities, against the powers and this hierarchy, as you see there, this hierarchy of demon spirits. 
Just as there are angels, and we're gonna see there's different ranks of angels, there are demons and different ranks of demons. I think we see four categories there in Ephesians chapter six. We see this war in this unseen spirit realm that coexists with ours. That realm is existing right now. We can't see it. It's, it's, it's a spirit realm. We will be able to see it is once we uh, die and our spirit goes to heaven or we're raptured, whatever the case may be, we'll be in that spirit realm and we'll be able to see. I don't know if we'll see things here on earth, but we're gonna be in that realm uh, up in heaven. But we see this war taking place in one of the cool little segments of scripture in Daniel chapter 10. In Daniel chapter 10, Daniel has a vision. And, and he goes on this partial fast and he's fasting and he's, he's praying and he's asking God for clarity on, on what he just saw. And, and finally, uh, this messenger shows up and, and this uh, angel says, hey, Daniel, I heard you on day one of your prayer, but it's taken me 21 days to bring you the answer from God. Why, you might ask? The angel says, I was accosted by the prince of Persia, and I've been wrestling with him for 21 days. Now, because this angel is in the spirit realm, this, this prince of Persia uh, is, is a spirit. We're not talking about an actual human prince. He says, this prince stopped me and, and, and we, we wrestled. He restrained me for 21 days. Persia, as you know, very interesting, modern day Iran. He says, it was only until Michael came and basically, you know, I don't know if we, I, like in, WWE, where you tag out and he jumps the ropes and come in, or they two on one him, I'm not sure. But he says, I had to call upon Michael. And Michael came and, and, and allowed me to come and get here. And, and here's interpretation. He gives him interpretation and says, I got to go now. But the war's not done. In fact, now I know as soon as I go back, now I got to fight the prince of Greece. So now we've got two spirits that look as, if, looks as if they are ruling demons over nations. The ruling demon over the nation of Persia, and I'm assuming is that same angel is now the ruling demon over Iran. And the ruling demon at the time of Greece, and I, I'm not sure why we would think that same demon wouldn't be ruling over Greece now. I don't think they age out. Uh, but very interesting. What's also interesting is that Persia and Greece were part of that vision of the, of the four, of the, of the image of the statue, right? Ruling nations at the time. Uh, nations that probably these angels had to fight with because they probably wanted to exterminate Israel. Why? To kill the nation so the Messiah couldn't be, war be born through there. So very deep stuff. It's you can really get off in the weeds in some of this stuff. But the main thing I wanna to talk to you about is that there's a battlefield going on in the spirit realm. And Paul says here in 2 Corinthians 10, the battlefield oftentimes is our mind. It's our mind. Satan seeks to break into our minds, burglarize our thoughts, and take us hostage by controlling how we think. That's his end game, to introduce thoughts to introduce ideas, to get us to think so he can control us and go a certain direction. Now, let me end our time by giving you three common things the enemy seeks to introduce into our minds. Number one, they'll introduce lies and half-truths. Flat-out lies and then half-truths. I got a little bit of truth in it, but it's also got some lie in there. This is what Satan accomplished with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Let me read to you those verses and I'll show you where the lie is and I'll show you where the half-truth is. Verse one, now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. The woman said, first of all, God didn't say that. Right, that's a lie. That's, that, that's just a flat out bold-faced lie. 
God said, God didn't say you couldn't eat from any tree. He said, you can't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Other trees were, were fine. The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the gardens, uh, of the trees of the garden, we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it. He didn't say couldn't touch it, did he? He said, you can't eat from it. But I, I don't read anywhere where he said, you can't touch it. So now Eve's already getting confused now. Now she's confused. Boy, whenever you start a dialogue with the devil, you are sunk, gonna get confused. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. Lie, she will die. Verse five, for God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be open. Half truth, true, yeah. And you will be like God. No, you're created, you're not God. Knowing good and evil, yeah, you'll know that. When the woman saw the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from his fruit and ate, and she gave to her husband with her, and he ate. In verse seven, the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and we've been a mess ever since. <clears throat> Should have never dialogued with him. Should have never gone to that conversation with him. Just do what God has told you to do. Just do it. We've got to recognize any thought, anything that goes against God's word, anything that gets introduced into your brain and my brain, if it does not line up or if it goes against, God, goes against God's word, reject it. It's not from God. And if it's not from God, there's a good chance it's from the other side. Reject it. Don't move upon it. Don't sit there and have a dialogue like Eve did because you'll get confused. You'll begin to justify what you're doing. You'll begin to excuse it. And you'll begin to say, well, maybe this is a good thing and maybe, maybe this isn't so bad. And If it's wrong, it's wrong. If it's right, it's right, according to God's word. Next, Satan will get us to believe speculations. Speculations. The Greek word for speculations is logismos, and it, it's a math term, it's a computation, it's a reasoning. It's basically, it's taking a, a set of circumstances, and, or a circumstance, punching in the numbers, putting in the odds, looking back at past trends, looking at future tracking, and oh, here's what's gonna happen. Here, here's what's gonna happen, it's a speculation. It hasn't actually happened, but, but logically, it will happen. It's a thought placed in our mind that the devil wants you to compute to his logical ending. I've learned a lot about true crime being married to Vicki Loman. She loves watching those true crime shows. She got them all recorded at her house. She loves them. And I do too now, because it's kind of a challenge to kind of figure out oh, who, who did this. But here's what I've learned from watching those things is that, man, the person, oftentimes that you think, oh, it's them, guilty, yeah, no, no brainer. My gosh, it's the husband, you know, he's going through a divorce, he's blown all of his money, she's got like a gazillion dollar life insurance policy on her, and oh, he has no good alibi, obviously it's him, and you've already got him guilty, and lo and behold, they do some DNA and find out it's not him, but some other guy. I mean, everything logically looked like it should be this guy, but it wasn't. That's a speculation. And I noticed this. A lot of cops, they, they, get, they get tunnel vision. They, they get on some of these things, and they, they just go down one track, and they don't, they don't look at other avenues and stuff. King Saul when God rejected him from being the first king of Israel, you know the story, a demon spirit began to harass him. The spirit of God left him, a demon spirit began to hassle him. In fact, remember he called for young David before David was king and, and whenever David would play the harp, that spirit would leave. I believe this spirit put a speculation in King Saul's head. And the speculation was that David, Saul had probably heard that, hey, Samuel anointed this kid, to be the next king of Israel. That demon put in Saul's brain, he's gonna kill you. He's gonna kill you, Saul. In fact, that's what they often did in those days. 
when the new king would come in, he'd either kill the, the former king or he'd kill all of his kids so, so they wouldn't try to come and take his throne. So Saul probably thought, hey, he's, he's gonna get me. He's gonna get me, man. He, he wants his throne. Even though he'd been rejected, he's still trying to hold on to it. And it tormented him. And Saul kept trying to kill David, throwing spears at him and chasing him for something that David wasn't even doing. David wasn't trying to kill Saul. In fact, David withheld himself twice. You know the story, if you know your Bibles. He, he could have killed him a couple of times and didn't do it. But in Saul's mind, he'd given in that speculation. Speculations, to me, are one of the most cruelest attacks of the enemy. It's evil. I had, I experienced one uh, over 10 years. I can't remember, I'm losing track of time. 10 years ago or so, Vicki and I got into a little tiff and she said something that I interpreted. She didn't say it, but I interpreted it that she didn't love me or at least she didn't like me. And, you know, if she didn't like me, that was almost as bad as you don't, didn't love me. That means if you, if you don't like me, you don't want to be around me. And that's, that's what I heard. She didn't say it, but that's what I heard. And man, I, I sat on that thing. I should, have, I should have talked with her and said, what did you mean by this? And got it out. But I, I, I just held on to that thing. And Satan just had a field day with me. Your wife doesn't like you. She doesn't want to be around you. You're not attractive to her. She'd rather be with somebody else. And of course, a lot, of, a lot of guys who we don't process our emotions really well, rather than just being hurt, I started getting angry saying, well, you know what? Hey, fine, two can play that game. Yeah, fine. You don't want me? I bet somebody does. And I, man, I, I felt myself pulling away from her and I, I, oh man. And it didn't go on long. It didn't go on long. In fact, we talked, we were able to get it resolved. And she said, I didn't say this. And I know, I just, the enemy just, he took advantage of it. And, and I just, I wasn't on guard. And I let that thought come in there. But it was, it was hell on earth. It was, it was torturous. It was, it's cruel. Those speculations are, they're horrible. Lastly, the enemy will try to control us by fear. My poor wife, you women that have, She's probably shared from the pulpit for you guys too, but my poor wife, she'll tell you, she lost her, the decade of her 30s. She said it was a wasted decade. Vicki will tell you, she was so consumed with fear of dying that it, it just ruined it. She couldn't enjoy really anything during her 30s. Remember the story? It all started when we moved into this rental house and, and she looked in the medicine cabinet and saw a prescription uh, that was left there by the previous tenant about some heart medication. And I don't know why, I, I, I can't remember all the details, but for some reason, that thing triggered something in Vicky that says, you're gonna die of a heart attack. And again, I don't know the details, but, but at that point, something jumped on her. And, and so for the next 10 years, Vicky feared having a heart attack. It culminated, you might remember the story, as we were at... Uh, Seth's, my son, Sarah Seth's, I can't, can't remember, one of their baseball, softball practices. And Vicki hadn't shared this with me. She hadn't shared that she's struggling with this. She hadn't shared that she's, you know, having these phantom heart things. And all of a sudden she says, Doug, I said, I, I, I can't feel my left arm. What? I said, take me to the hospital. What? And this not a blue, what? Take me to the hospital. So my mom was like, mom, watch the kids. And so I got her in the truck and I'm flying down the freeway in Bakersfield. She says, Doc, I can't feel it. I'm, I'm, I'm going out. I'm going out. And, and I rush her to the hospital and I pull up there. I need an ambulance. I need a stretcher. And they got her in there, ran all these tests and said, your heart's fine. Nothing wrong with your heart. You just had a panic attack. And that's when she told me that she'd been struggling with it. And for the next 10 years, it was a fight for her. And praise the Lord, by God's grace and Vicky's fight, she was finally able to defeat that and overcome it, taking those thoughts captive, and it, it doesn't bother her anymore. Now, she will tell you she has to be on guard. That, that's her weakness. And, and Vicky said, I, I'm just, I just resigned myself. I, I don't live in fear anymore. But Vicky says, I just got to, you know, I've just resigned myself that whenever I go to the hospital or the doctor's office, just for a normal routine, she gets what is called white coat syndrome. And you know what that is? Her heart starts beating fast and, and they'll put that blood pressure cuff on her and all of a sudden, you know, it's like a, you know, 
300 over 900 or whatever. It's just high. She says, I just have white coaster in them and I know. And she takes it at home, it's fine. But she gets there and it's, it's just one of those things. We can live with that. We can live with that. Fear paralyzes us. That's the whole intent by the enemy. Wants to just stop us in our tracks. Why? Because if he can stop you in your tracks, you can't move to that place that God wants you to move to. You can't do those things that God wants you to move to. Vicki will tell you for 10 years, man, she, she, she did ministry, but, but it, was, it was hard because she just constantly fighting this thing. She, I'm sure she wasn't as effective as she could have been had she not been controlled by that speculation and that fear. Let me end with, with this portion of scripture to, to see the detriment of fear. Nehemiah 4, verse 9. <clears throat> Remember, they're rebuilding the wall. They've been in Babylon. They're back now. They're rebuilding the wall. They're rebuilding the temple. They're getting back in their homeland where they can worship God. And of course, the enemy doesn't want that. The enemy does not want you to worship God. The enemy does not want to have you have rebuilt what what your sin has destroyed. Israel had sinned. They were brought into captivity. Now they're going back. They'd repented. And now the enemy is trying to, to, to tear them down. He wanted to keep them in bondage. You who are coming out of drugs and alcohol, you who are coming out of broken marriages, you who are trying to put down porn, good for you. You're in the right direction, but don't think it's, the enemy is going to go down without a fight. Oh, he had you. He doesn't like losing you. And so here we have this story where all of a sudden now the enemy's saying, we got to get these guys. We got to stop them before they get too strong again. The enemy wants to get you when you're weak because he knows if you get strong again, it's going to be harder to get you. But we pray to our God and because of them, we set up a guard against them day and night. Thus in Judah, it was said, the strength of the burden bearers is failing, yet there's much rubbish. And we ourselves are unable to rebuild the wall. Our enemies said they will not know or see until we come among them, <clears throat> kill them and put a stop to the work. When the Jews who lived near them came and told us 10 times, they will come up against us from every place where you may turn. Then I stationed men in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, the exposed places. And I stationed the people and the families with their swords, spears, and bows. When I saw their fear, the fear of the people, all these enemies are big, they're threatening us. Are we going to be able to rebuild? Are we going to be able to do it? The officials and the rest, he said, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. He said, you got to fight. Your, your, your love for your family, your love for your God has to be greater than the fear that you face. You have to fight. Now, let me... And let me give you three R's to spiritual victory, okay? Write these down. Recognize the source of the attack. Not everything you go through is spiritual in nature. Sometimes it's just your flesh. Sometimes you just didn't get enough sleep or you're hangry or you're, you know, you're whatever the case may be, okay? That's, that's just, you know, human. You're sick. You don't feel real good, so you're not, you know, real good mood, okay? But recognize when you're under spiritual attack. How do you know when you're under spiritual attack? There are little telltale signs. You're agitated. You're super agitated. Things just kind of seem to be, you know, kind of confusing. You're kind of confused and, 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 and head's not real clear. Uh, there's things to be obstacles, things that are kind of happening here. Just, oh, man, why did that happen? Why does this, man, why does it feel like I'm, I'm running against the wind or something? Very often it's just the enemy. That, that's what's taking place. Number two, resist the attack in Jesus' name. Stand firm, the Bible says. Resist the devil and he will flee. We don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. You don't have to go around and, you know what, I'm going to kick the devil's hind in. Number one, you couldn't anyway. He's stronger than us. And number two, you don't have to. Jesus already did. He's been defeated. You just got to stand in it. When I'm under spiritual attack, what I will do oftentimes for me is I'll, be, I'll, I'll get just a little bit quieter. Not, not totally quiet. I just withdraw. 
But I know sometimes if, if, if I'm under attack, I'll say some things that I probably aren't really you know, of spirit. I'll complain, I'll gripe, I could lose my temper. I'm also, whenever I've got something pretty big that I think the enemy might want to attack on, Vicky and I are on guard. Like on Sunday morning when one of us teach, we're super sensitive not to say anything irritating, not to, not to do anything that's gonna cause an argument because we know the enemy would love to stir that, love to get us caught up in that, love to have us fight before we teach, before we come to church. So, so be on the alert, the Bible says. Your devil prowls like a roaring lion, so, so be sensitive, be alert, know what it feels like. And then lastly, rejoice in the victory of the Lord over the power of darkness. Just thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. When I'm under attack, you know what, Satan and demons, I take authority over those thoughts. I bind those thoughts in Jesus' name. Get out of my mind. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Holy Spirit, just fill me. And I'll begin to worship and I'll begin to just, just shout and I'll begin to proclaim things and just, just thanking the Lord. The devil hates praise. He hates praise. Put on the spirit of praise in place of the spirit of heaviness, the Bible says. Go ahead and stand up. Father, Lord, we are in a battle, Lord. But Lord, we're on the winning side. We're on your side. Greater is he who is in us than he that is in the world. And Father, I pray right now, God, Lord, I, I pray strength for every single person here, Lord, right now. I pray, God, that, Lord, if they are under spiritual attack, I pray right now, God, that, Lord, you would fill them with the Holy Spirit, that, God, they would stand firm against the enemy, and he will flee. I pray, God, that anybody that's given their mind over, open up doors to the enemy, that tonight they will ask you, say, God, help me to close those doors. Help me to close that, that portal that I've been allowing the enemy to come in. Let them come up for prayer if they need to. Let them come up and confess sin if they need to. In fact, during worship, as, as we worship right now, if some of you have just opened up your mind to some stuff, pornography, a lie that you aren't worth much, maybe you're considering taking your life and nobody would miss me, A lie that what you did in the past has disqualified you from being used by God in the future. Any, anything that, that is a stronghold in your mind, that, that just controls your mind. Fear, anxiety, depression, any of those things. I want to encourage you just to come up during this song to the altar. Fall on your knees if you need to. Stand if you need to and say, Lord, please just set me free, Lord. Lord, I, I, my, mind only, my mind is meant to have you in there. I only want the Holy Spirit's thoughts. Confess any sin you need to confess. Call out to God and say, God, from this point on, I'm gonna take every thought captive, Lord. Give me the strength to do it, God. And so, so let there might be some breakthrough through some of you tonight. So Lord, we, we thank you, God, that you've given us everything pertaining to life and godliness, God. Thank you for that. We love you. We thank you. We proclaim you as our Lord. We declare that you're the great I am, that just that name, there's power. I'm sure that in the spirit realm, when, when just like when you said, I am he, that the people fell back, I'm sure that when we declare I am, that the, the, the demon spirits fall back. We thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.